In this video, I'll show you how I made this banjo. I started with the rim, which was made from segments of construction around me, which were cut to 30 degrees on each end. I made a dopey clamping fixture to try and make gluing each layer a little bit easier. I didn't get the angles exactly right, so I glued them up in halves. Hexagons also weren't completely flat, so I flattened them with a drum sander. The layers were glued up, lined up by eye. I had a bit of leeway with the thickness of the material. I want the topmost layer to be as hard as possible to hopefully act similar to a tone ring. I got this box of various woods from a second hand shop a while back. First tried to use Goncalo Alves but it warped pretty heavily. I then tried checking but messed up the measurements and didn't have enough to use. So I eventually ended up using that wood. First try to get the rim round using the spindle sander, but it didn't work and left a wavy surface. The obvious way to make the rim round is with some sort of lathe. I don't own a lathe big enough, so I figured I'd try and make a quick and shoddy one. The spindle was turned down so that one end could be gripped by a drill chuck. The face plate was made and glued together around the spindle. The hole cut was used to cut the hole for some bearings. The headstock end was then assembled onto a big slab of spruce. The drill was held on with this router base that happened to fit the drill collar, which made things a bit easier. The first idea was to turn it with a chisel. This was a bit harrowing though, especially with the runaway speed control of the drill, and having to do the inside the same way would be pretty dangerous with the interrupted cut. Rather than fuss with getting some real tools and trying to learn turning on a difficult job, I decided to stick to what I know, metal lathes. I used paper templates to help cut the plywood parts out. A 30 degree dovetail angle was cut on the table saw. A jib strip was used so I could adjust the fit of the dovetail to it slide it easily, but without a lot of play. I got it assembled and set square enough for the rough cuts. The tool hole is just a slot cut into a bit of plywood. The depth of the cut is advanced by just pushing the tool further out from the tool post. Didn't take me long to start using the battery drill to move the cross slide. It didn't take long for the nut to clog up with iron filings from the rough threaded rod. The replacement screw was heavily greased to hopefully slow down the wear. But soon after that the workpiece escaped the faceplate. The tool geometry I was using wasn't very good and it let the tool dig in too easily. I made a much better shaped tool bit, but barely got tested before the drill stopped working. The drill was very worn when I got it, so I tried making a replacement part from steel. It wasn't a great choice of material since it friction welded itself to the spindle. I picked up a cheap replacement drill at the boot sale, which had a much better speed control. Since I was getting near the final diameter, I started a check of the sides of parallel using dividers. I then moved the cross slide to get the outside of the rim. I pushed the drill a bit too much though. The bushes just got too hot. Replacing them fixed it. I used a selection of router bits to round over the top. 
and finish it off with a bit of sanding back on the lathe. It was then separated and had the remaining bit routed off with a flush trim bit. The bottom was left unfinished since I wasn't sure how tall I wanted the thing to be yet. A lot of this banjo was built to fit, so rather than complete the rim 100% I started making the hardware that was going to attach to it. In the past they made 50 hooks and nuts for this ridiculous 12 inch rim, which only came with the shoes. With so many of them to make I ended up putting a lot of thought into how to best do them, and I'm more or less doing the exact same thing this time. I started by parting off sections of 4mm brass rod, with the bar extended to touch the tailstock each time. The bars are then partially threaded. The tailstock chuck is used to push the die forwards and keep it flat with a small slug held in the chuck. When the threads get to the right length, the bar hits the slug and the die starts moving forwards from the face of the chuck. At this point the lathe is reversed to get the die off. They're all marked and then bent. Brass, especially CZ121, tends to work hard and get brittle. To get around this, they're annealed partway through the bending. An even brass does heat it up till it's barely glowing and then letting it cool. An aluminium fixture, which is just a block with a hole drilled in it and a bit filed out, is used with a slit and saw to trim the excess off. A few came out noticeably oversized. Accuracy is determined mostly by the bending step, but it won't really be noticeable around the banjo rim. Next up with the nuts. I used the indexing feature of the four-way tool post with a couple of form tools and a couple of carriage stops to shape and trim each nut blank from the same hex bar. Blanks were then drilled and tapped. The shoes are a pretty awkward shape to make. I had the idea of routing a bar using a burr in the router table, and tests seemed to suggest it would work. Unfortunately, to buy a bar in that shape would have cost twice the price of buying it in this shape. The bar I got was a half inch squared, and one side needed to be taken down to about 10mm, so I cut on the bandsaw. Take a note of that bit curling though, the thicker bit curled too. I just bent it back by hand till it was straight enough, then sent it through a drum sander. Kinda overdid it though and the bar ended up 9mm wide instead of the intended 10. This was then cut into chunks using a hacksaw. I stuck pins into a plate to make a fixture to hold the parts in the drill. We were then tapped M5. I was reluctant to give up on that burr idea. It was never going to work, but I had to try it. But in the end, I just had to shape them by hand. The bases that were given a slight dish to accommodate the rim better. I got this polishing kit from a popular automotive store, mostly since I didn't want to wait for the delivery of the fancy stuff, but it worked out pretty well. There wasn't much to hold onto with the shoes and the nuts, but both had threaded portions so it wasn't too difficult to make handles for them. The neck was mostly made from the same construction Maranti as the rim, but taking a look at the edge grain shows that it's far from the ideal quarter sawn, so it was at risk of warping in weird ways. On top of that, it also wasn't wide enough for the neck. So I got to laminate it with this bit of wand, I think. The walnut was also not quarter sawn, so I split that down the middle. 
the bolts were then flipped so the growth rings opposed each other. The idea being that any warpage will cancel out. They were then glued up. To shape the neck I first started by making an MDF template of the side profile. A little box was made to sand the headstock angle, an idea borrowed from Fletcher who has some great videos on making guitars. I then cut to the line, or as close to the line as I dared, and used the drum sound to get the curves. For the back of the neck I decided to just bring it down very carefully with the sanding block. I also routed the channel for the truss rod. Then glued extensions on the headstock since it wasn't wide enough. I thought it'd be clever and match the grain of the wood, but I didn't have any bits big enough. The back of the headstock was then thicknessed in the drum sander. I also made the truss rod out of some brass and threaded rod. The stepped end was a stupid idea which would have required routing out more material from the neck, so I thought I'd make the part again but thinner. Due to the mismatching grain I figured I'd need to put some sort of veneer on the front of the headstock to hide it, so I'm using these two small bits of matching burl. They weren't quite big enough so I had to half them again. It was then glued onto the headstock. I should have put pins in and try to locate it since it slid with the glue. I didn't have any bits of wood big enough to make the fretboard, so I thought I'd try something novel. I started by cutting some strips to check and then pair wood. Gluing the strips together was done with this goofy setup. The greaseproof paper stops the sticks from sticking to what they shouldn't stick to, and the tiny wedges provide the clamping pressure. It was then neatened up. It slipped a few times so the layers were noticed to be shifted. There were also some inevitable gaps but nothing too major. Another MDF template was made for the fretboard profile. The flush trim round a bit was used to trim the fingerboard to it. The fretboard was then thickness to 6mm. Fret positions were marked through a paper template with a chisel. I figured the template would probably be more accurate than using a tape measure. The intended scale length of the banjo is 666mm, and I just got the fret positions from Stumat's fret position calculator. For cutting the fret slots, I epoxied a hacksaw blade into a block of wood, which rides against the face of this sort of rubbish miter box. The depth of the cut is limited by how far the hacksaw blade pokes out. The wood had a slight reflection that made lining up the hacksaw blade a lot easier than it would have been otherwise. I got too used to the old carpet that barely hung on, but the new stuff is intense. I guess I at least proved that this laminated fingerboard is plenty strong. Before I could glue the fretboard to the neck, I had to add the tube for the tunnel fifth string. This required routing a space for it. Then there's just a bit of carving and bending to get it to fit properly. I also squashed the tube a bit just so I had to route out less material. After that it was then filled with epoxy. To stop the fretboard from slipping when it's glued on, I drove a couple of pins into the neck and cut the heads off. I also put some globs of silicon sealer into the truss rod slot just to prevent the truss rod from buzzing once it's sealed in. Then glue the fretboard on.
held Carl from the neck, I decided to make a couple of rasps, mostly since real rasps are quite expensive, and had varying success. The first idea was to take some old Fazaha hanging around and grind the teeth off and yield them and then put the teeth back in. A quick test, heating them and then letting them cool in a wood fire seemed to prove the theory, but I had trouble repeating the annealing. Because the wood fire wasn't deep enough, I first tried blocking the ends of the forge and letting them cool in that. But it didn't work, they got to cool down quite slowly. The next attempt was cooling them in a bucket of vermiculite, which here does work but only if it's very dry. The stuff felt dry but it obviously had some absorbed water in it. I was then told that wood ashes worked well, so I thought I'd try heating and cooling them in a crappy air fed charcoal forge, except it got a bit too hot. The big rasp survived though and had softened quite well. I was able to put teeth into that. The put in with a pointed chisel. After that, it's just heated and quenched to reharden it. Covering it with regular bar soap as it was heated helped prevent scaling and the teeth from burning off. Since the blank intended to be the half round melted, I thought I'd try making another one from mild steel and case hardening it. One method of case hardening is to seal it in a container packed with fine charcoal, then heat it up for an hour. But pardon to the process, the pressure rose and the lid of the canister popped off, ejecting the contents into my face. Luckily they were only slightly warm so it didn't uh, burn my face off. Ideally the seal shouldn't be perfect and should still let the gas escape, but the fire cement I used uh, provided a very good seal and I wasn't brave enough to try it a second time. With the fretboard on I could route the rest of the neck to match. I bought some bearings to turn the bottom bearing route a bit into a top bearing route a bit, since the real ones are damn expensive. I messed it up though and rose the router so high that the collet nut was poking out from the table, which gouged the sides of the fretboard before I noticed it. While I was thinking of what to do to fix it, I routed the headstock shape in using yet another template, and used the same template to drill holes for the tuners. To fix that cock up I decided to just make edge banding from drain pipe iron flat. I think it's ABS pipe though, I'm not sure. To route the ledge for the binding, I modified a route a bit by loctiting a ring into the bearing to reduce its depth of cut. The stuff was held in with just super glue. It was then scraped and sand and flush. At this point I also opened up access to the truss rod again. I lost my lighter. I used the flame to soften the plastic so I could bend it to match the curve of the headstock. I also used the table saw to clean up the nut slot. It was finally time to carve the damn neck. I had a lot of time to prepare so I collected a whole gamut of carving tools from car boot sales since I was expecting this to be a big job. Seems there's a lot of ways people like to carve necks and I thought facets made the most sense by marking to cut flats into the neck at a tangent to the intended curve. And the actual carving took no time at all, probably less than half an hour. I moved the bulk of wood with the rasp I made, getting the corners of a half round cross cut file. I decided the whole facet thing was too complicated to continue to a second set of facets, so I just went hog wild with the rasp and scraper. The whole process was a lot less scary than I imagined it would be. I realised after a bit that the curve didn't have to match any sort of plan, and as long as it felt about right to hold and didn't look blatantly stupid, then it'd probably be alright. It was a coarse sand and smooth, and by the end of it, I barely got to use the tools I collected. Didn't even get a chance to try the shear forms. After carving the neck I fit it to the rim. The neck needs not only a backwards angle, but it also needs a sideways angle to accommodate the neck being asymmetric. Throughout building it I pretended the centre line of the neck was down the middle of the joint rather than through the third string where it actually is. So it needs an angle so the third string lines up through the centre of the banjo. If you don't do this there's a tendency for the bridge to get pulled sideways and off centre. Before any of that though I need to drill some holes from out the neck. 
and then made a setup for cutting the heel and cut the heel. I thought it'd be clever and try and make the tension hoop out of some fuel for stainless. It was bent around a cut off and then the percentage spring back was measured. A form was then made the same percentage undersized to the banjo rim. The best way to join the hoop probably would have been with some silver solder, but rather than wait for delivery, I decided to try welding it with regular welding rods. I did a test early on some offcuts and found it produced a surprisingly strong but brittle weld. So naturally the first thing I did when I got the real thing was to try bend it to correct a curve. I thought I'd try to bridge the gap with another bit of steel instead, but being 304 stainless it was very difficult to drill. So I got fed up and just welded a lump of steel on. It wasn't a good idea at all, but I was in a hurry for some reason. But with the hoop made, I could then figure out the ideal position for the shoes. I made a template for the shoe positions and drilled them. I also drilled holes for the coordinator rod. To hold the neck on, a kind of double bowel bolt was made, with the coordinator rod screwing into that. Then I found notches for the hooks, which was tough work in the stainless steel. Then it was assembled to check it all fits. A bit of the neck was cut away to accommodate the tension hoop. I start by putting an ever so slight chamfer on the edges of the fret slot. To remove the tang where the frets overhang the edge banding, I just used the file. I used the drill press to push the frets in. I also figured it would be difficult to find the 12th fret if I didn't put some side dots in. I filed the excess frets down, but got a bit carried away and put some gouges in the edge banding. And sound the frets flat, or flatter. I don't think it's necessary to get it absolute. By the end of the day it's wood and it's not that accurate. It makes more sense to fix problems like high frets if they actually cause problems. To put the round top back onto the frets, I made a stupid block of wood with a groove in it that I glued sandpaper into. There were a few more miscellaneous things to make before I could string the banjo up. First being the nut, which I made out of brass. The nut has a hole drilled to to accommodate the fifth string. I then made a tailpiece. I based it off of one of those Fultz tailpieces, mostly since it was the widest tailpiece I could find. I wanted it to be as wide as possible to cover that ugly weld and the tension band. But I think in the end the tailpiece looks stupider than I think any funky weld ever would. Being bare steel it would have been prone to rust. I've read that getting the thing blue just from heating it up can somewhat protect it. So I gave it a try carefully heating it till it went blue. Then dip in oil. Time will tell if it actually works. I got it all assembled and playable, and then begrudgingly disassembled so I could finish the last few things and put the varnish on. I found some shellac in a second hand shop, so I went with that for the finish. It comes as flakes and needs to be dissolved in alcohol. I crushed the flakes a bit so it'd hopefully dissolve quicker. While waiting for the shark to dissolve, I adjusted the heat angle a bit and then sanded the cut off the rim. I'd collected the sawdust from the drum sander and used that to fill the pores by rubbing it on with some fairly dilute shellac. Then sanding it off and repeating. I did the same to the neck. Then using a stronger shellac solution, I then started wiping it on with a ball of cloth. I occasionally wet sanded it once I felt like I built up a fairly thick layer. And I kept doing this all damn day, mostly because I couldn't get the pores to disappear. I must have done a good job grain filling. 
a few more courses of this stuff might have filled the pores in. But I decided I had enough and it was probably good enough to protect the wood. I then gave it a buff with some automotive tea cut to make it look less grubby. And time to assemble the thing. There were a few little jobs to do here and there. The truss rod cover is cancelled a little bit just to line up that wonky veneer seam. After it was all together I then got stringed up. I think it turned out fairly well overall. It also looks a lot fancier than what I had in mind. Stuff like the peg head veneer, the goofy fretboard and the edge banding all made out of circumstance, mostly hide mistakes. I guess it's kind of funny that the more mistakes I had to hide, the fancier it became. That said, there were still a few bad bits here and there. Anyways, thanks for watching.